paper on this at some point. The basic idea is that you have a wild semi metal and you can ask what happens. So let's speak, uh, let's imagine doing this thought experiment again of sliding a slice across the system and measuring the churn number as I go. So if I think, uh, if I start moving my slice around, until I intercept a wild node, I have, um, I don't have any churn numbers, so therefore I don't have any 2B. Uh, so if I think about trying to measure, in this example, measure sigma xy in the 2D plane, I'll have a zero sigma xy contribution from each of these planes. And then at this, whenever, once I've crossed the wild node, I have a series of planes that have essentially the physics of a churn insulator, and we know that that gives you a sigma xy um, of uh, 1 in the unicity squared over H. So I'll get that for every slice that I can take through this one. So as long as I'm moving my little momentum space slice through these parameters, these values of KZ, I see this. And then at K0, uh, at K0, when I cross the other wild node, I actually drop back to getting no churn number again, and so no sigma xy. So if I add this up, I get a sigma xy contribution simply by integrating this. I get a sigma xy, a 3D sigma xy contribution, e squared over h times 2K0. And you can interpret that by saying there's one copy of the two-dimensional integer quantum Hall effect for every 2 pi over 2K0 layers in the xy direction. So that's one way of thinking about this. So there's some fine print with these signatures, which Fermi-Ask physics, quantum oscillation, usually often require extremely clean samples. And also, the more subtle thing is that in some cases, the Fermi-Ask surface may be tough to clean. And so that makes our test difficult if you want to try and do our test. Uh, although, I must say that there are nice experiments now that sort of mean the uh, quantum oscillations are probably our best evidence of wild study metals at this point. Um, the quantum is almost all conductivity. One important input is that you might expect that you've got a material, if it's particularly in the wild study metals, is broken time reversal, you might expect other sources of getting sigma xy. So the key point was that quantization in terms of the uh, separation between the nodes. So there's a parameter in there, which is this 2k0 on the previous slide. So you need an independent input for this. You need the location of the nodes in the robot zone. Without that, the signature is not very useful because you might just not be able to distinguish it from other sources of the, uh, the anomalous content. Now, the other more serious contribution is that in some cases, contributions from several pairs of nodes can cancel because imagine you had uh, things that, you know, um, you have, it turns out that with enough symmetry in the problem, several different nodes can give you competing contributions to sigma xy from different values to a chain number. And in the end, you won't get a net contribution to sigma xy. So what we'd like to do is find more generic signatures and transport in the quantized Melbourne Hall effect. And transport is typically the first thing we can do with many of these samples. So we'd like to talk a little bit about what transport can be. So what I want to focus on is that the topological properties of these wild semi metals show up in transport to the physics of this thing called the axial anomaly. It's a high energy literature. It's called the axial anomaly. It turns out it's a fairly prosaic thing in connect matters. Um, so let me just tell you the sort of history of this. So this goes back to work by Adler, Bell, and Jacques in the late, uh, late 60s. And the basic idea is that, uh, let me just tell you about this application of the vial semi metal. In a vial semi metal, you have two vial fermions with opposite chirality. So I didn't spend much time talking about the chirality, but I did talk about the fact that these vial semi metals act as sources or sinks of churn flux with Olanza. So if you think of these sources of sinks of very, uh, of very flux, um, it turns out that's tied to the fact that there's a certain handedness with which the electron spin moves around the wild semi metal, and that tells you this notion of chirality. And the fact that you have a source and a sink basically tells you that they always come in chiral partners. So there's always one left-handed and one right-handed chiral uh, wild fermion that you can create. So I'm imagining this geometry where I have a three-dimensional bulk wild semi metal, and just to set up my axes. I apply a magnetic field, in the, uh, magnetic field and an electric field power of the magnetic field. So first let me apply the magnetic field and forget about the physics of the electric field for a second. Um, so what you'll find is that, actually I'm going to get into a microscopic definition discussion of this a little bit, so let me skip back for a moment. Um, basically what ends up happening in the presence of electric and magnetic fields is that the electric current, which is the same for both nodes, so J right plus J left, so right and left are going to label these nodes, is always conserved. What ends up happening, though, is that this magnetic field acts as a source in uh, this combination of electric and magnetic fields acts as a source for charge in one node and acts as a sink for charge in the other node. And this looks kind of mysterious. So you can think of, uh, I'll show you that the real way to think about this is that in the presence of an electric and magnetic field, there's just a channel that opens up that allows you to pump charge from one node to the other. And so if you actually define the quantity, a uh, conserved quantity that was related to this, the, the sort of 
flavor index of these two nodes, um, you might call it a Dali index. I like the terminology because I've thought a lot about semiconductors, and that's how the terminology is used. Then this Dali current would not be conserved because you'd be producing charge here, subtracting charge here, and if you take the difference, that there's a net effect there. So, to see the microscopic origin of that, let's imagine you take these two biofermions of opposite chirality, and I'm imagining a generic case where they're slightly dosed in both uh, nodes. Uh, now, let's imagine turning on a magnetic field. If I turn on a magnetic field, I'm going to quantize, these, uh, no, uh, quantize the electron motion into cyclotron orbit, except along the z direction. So, the magnetic field is along z, the so motion in the xy plane is quantized the cyclotron orbit. But the motion in the z direction actually still just moves, uh, just has its own momentum. And so I can draw, I can, each of these dots is a two-dimensional lambda level with the state. And what I'm drawing is just how these states disperse in the magnet, uh, disperse with the, uh, uh, with the PC, which is still a good quantum number for this problem. So all I'm doing is just filling them up to the value I had before, but now I've quantized things into lambda levels. So each of these is just states that don't disperse at all in the XY plane. So it's flat band XY, and they disperse with, uh, they disperse in, uh, the Z direction. Now let's imagine I've got an electric field power of the magnetic field. Well, very simply, E is just KZ dot, it's the rate of change of the momentum. So basically what's going to happen is that I'm going to push momentum from the left to the right, so basically it's going to push states from here to here. And so this looks mysterious if I just have these two chiral one zones, but really what's happening is that there's a conducting channel deep under the, under the Fermi level, under the Fermi level that's actually carrying states over from the, um, from the one, from one wild zone to the next. And so this gives you the physics where you get the fact that uh, D mu J mu is just saying this is just a continuity equation. You can just argue that you deplete charge at one node and produce it at the other. So the bulk transport signatures of wild semi-metals we're going to think about are tied to whether this effect has measurable consequences that we can see in transport experiments. So that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk doing. So, oh, sorry, this should have been... Um, Unlike top, the problem with seeing um, any kind of topological transport signature in a wild semi-metal is that metallic transport can mass mass the topology of the system because you've got a topological signature, but you also just have a bunch of metal, a bunch of charge in the system. So you're going to get a meta normal metallic transport. So the key point is always trying to separate out the physics of this topological feature, this uh, this anomaly physics, from the regular physics that you just expect in any old metal. So that's the kind of uh, the name of the game for the rest of the stock, is to try and do this separation between these two pieces of physics, the physics that we want and the physics that we uh, would see in any other method. So it turns out that there is one thing you can get is that there's an additional anomaly current for E parallel to B. So this additional current can actually give you some an, an answer of trapez in the conductivity and some negative magneto resistance. This has been start discussed in many different papers. It also turns out that if you have some scattering, the combination of this anomaly physics and the scattering can give you a negative sort of classical magneto resistance effect. And this is uh, worked by Stone and Spiva. And in certain cases, you can imagine that this file, remember, I, I, I'll remind you that I said to get this file fundamental, you need either time reversal and inversion to be broken. So you, one way you can imagine breaking time reversal is by some kind of magnetic ordering. And then you might ask, do the collective modes of that magnetic ordering have some weird uh, behavior because of this anomaly? And it turns out there's some anomalous coupling between magnons and plasmons that show up in some of these biotary metal examples. But each of these has some drawbacks. For instance, when you talk about the anomaly current, I think uh, it might have been uh, later on the part of the talk that they might expect an anisotropy just on symmetry grounds, and so it's not particularly smoking gun, just because you have a huge magnetic field on the system. So you might expect some anisotropy parallel to the field for just, any, just the fact that you broke the symmetry to put the that direction. Um, also, this classical magneto resistance might get dominated by a positive magneto resistance contribution. Although, while I say that, it seems like there's really some um, really interesting magneto resistance data on these wild semi metals that seems to be hard to explain from any conventional explanation in experiments by the Princeton group and many other people by now. And examples like this time reversal breaking wild semi metal from magnetic order, what's well, very interesting when you start thinking about magnetic physics in these wild, wild materials, it's not, it's something very specific to that particular realization of the wild semi metal. It's not a generic signature that you can just say, go and do this in your lab. It's not something that you might look for. So what they're looking for is something that's a qualitative, sort of a yes or no type of question, rather than a quantitative big versus small signature. And that's our ideal type of signature for this wild semi metal. So what I want to uh, 
is talk about how you might see this anomaly by doing non-local transport measurements. And so this is sort of taking the lead from sort of the physics of um, you know, two-dimensional electron gases, often the kind of measurements you do are doing multi-terminal measurements. And so what I want to talk about a little bit is trying, looking for these vial semi-metals doing long local transport. So let's go back to this fact that this Dali charge that I talked about is effectively not conserved. So you have this fact that the view of the difference between the currents from the two nodes is uh, pumped by this electric field. So you have this source of charge. So one thing you can think about is if these nodes are separated in momentum space, there's a big difference in scattering rate that's required to relax the charge imbalance versus scattering, uh, the scattering rate that relaxes a valley imbalance. Because in order to relax an imbalance between these two valleys, you need to scatter a long way across the pole zone. You need to scatter from one node to the other. Whereas to relax the charge imbalance, you just need to scatter, relax the current that's produced from a single node. You can just scatter back, uh, uh, you can back scatter a single node. So essentially, valley imbalance, relaxing a valley imbalance requires internode scattering, but charge imbalance can relax with a single node. The key point is that if you're lucky and if you have so uh, impurity potentials that are relatively screened, and so you have some difference between um, scattering at long wavelengths with long uh, wavelengths with short wavelengths, then you can link. This. Remember, the topological transport always is linked to this.